Well, good evening. We want to welcome you to our Bible study. Let's begin with prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for the many blessings that you have showered upon us day by day. We thank you for this continuing celebration of the season after Epiphany, that Christmas cycle, your blessing that you've given to us through the gift of Jesus Christ. We pray that you continue to inspire us, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 13, and most people, when they see 1 Corinthians 13, they think, oh, it's that love passage, and it's all about marriage. And I'm going to outright tell you, it is not about love, not that type of love, certainly not about marriage. I know we read this almost every single wedding that we do. In fact, if you've been married, chances are very good, probably 80% chance that this passage was read at your marriage. If you actually knew what was behind this lesson for today, you might say, ooh, I'm not sure I really want this to be read for a wedding. I mean, it's nice that it's read for weddings. I get this sentiment, but it's actually really a different lesson than what you think it is. First thing we need to realize is that the church at Corinth was really an angry church, right? They were angry. They were mad at each other, all right? And so there was a great deal of conflict. These guys could not stand each other. So you have to understand that that's the context of this command to love one another. You guys can't stand each other. Well, I'm going to tell you the better way. Remember, over the course of the last couple of weeks, there was so much dissension within this church, so much conflict in this church, because the rich were fighting against the poor, the Jews were fighting against the Greeks. Everybody was fighting to say, my skills, my gifts are more important. Kind of like we do in this society, where we reward people for certain skills that honestly are not as important as others. And a professional athlete gets paid millions and millions and millions of dollars. Whereas the person who cleans the toilets at the stadium, who's much more important to whether or not I do or do not come back to that game, gets paid maybe $15 an hour. There's a real disconnect there. We value the wrong things. And the same thing was going on in the church. You're valuing the flashy person, the preacher, the uh, faith healer, the this person, but then all these other people who waited on tables and served others were getting neglected and certainly disrespected. And Paul is saying, those people who seem to have the lesser skills or the skills that you don't value are probably the most important people of all. So this is the conflict that's going on. He said, and Paul ends with the uh, lesson we did last week. So I want to show you a better way. You folks are fighting and fighting and fighting. There's a better way. Huh. Now we get to the passage. Do you get now the context? Why this passage has nothing to do about your wedding day, your marriage. Now, listen, if you come to me and want me to do uh, perform the ceremony or wedding and you'd like me to read from 1 Corinthians 13, I'd be very happy to do it. Okay? I'm not that cynical. However, just be aware, this passage has nothing to do about your marriage. It's about a church and a great deal of conflict. And so let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 13, shall we? And we're just going to pick this apart a little bit. St. Paul writes, where I, well, let me end with the end of um, chapter 12 here. Paul says, do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. I will show you the more excellent way. Now we get into our chapter for today. Chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in tongues of mortals and angels, but I do not have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Okay, so Paul is going to go through a list of things that people think they're somehow special because of the talents and the gifts and the abilities, maybe the spiritual gifts that they have. But those spiritual gifts mean nothing if they're not applied with love. So if a person comes up and says, well, I'm a prayer warrior, but then they're massively judgmental, and they 
don't have any love for people with whom they disagree with their systematic theology, okay? They're like a clanging cymbal, clanging gong. It, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, we are having this problem in our church, the Church of Christ right now over the course of this last year or two, probably millennia as well too, when we as a church talk about how we're supposed to love each other and there are certain groups or classes of people that we exclude from love. We've excluded people from love like, oh, I don't know, gay people before. Oh, I just said it, right? Yeah, Muslims. Huh. We exclude certain people. They could never receive God's love because they got to repent and be like us. Really? God just loved you and brought you into the kingdom while you were yet sinners. You didn't somehow make yourself worthy of God's kingdom and therefore receive it. We just are called to love people. But what we Christians do is we go hating on people, okay? We hate on certain groups and classes of people. Oh, here we go. We hate on this group of people. At least this other group of people do. See, we got churches divided in conflict right now. We have churches that are almost 90% Republicans. I got a problem with that. There's something wrong here. We got churches that are 90% Democrats. And okay, because they somehow affiliate as a church with a particular political party. My perspective is if you don't have both represented in your church, you're doing something wrong. You're proclaiming a political message and not the message of Christ. And we've created division. We need to find a way that we are all united in Jesus Christ. We need to stop hammering on each other like this. Okay, it's about love. Social justice. So this is what the left wing just. Social justice, right wing. Oh, personal values, personal values. And so they start mouthing off about all these things that you need to do and everybody else needs to do that they value and so forth. You are like a clanging symbol. You may as well just be like, I don't know, the, the parents on Charlie Brown. Because that's all you sound like. All right? If love is not a part of it, if love isn't all of it, you're just wasting your breath. Okay. We're called love, peoples. Let's go on. So I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels, but don't have love. I'm a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have a prophetic voice and powers and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. Oh, social justice, social justice, social justice. This is a left-wing church. There's no love in that. It's a club that we beat people who disagree with our political ideology. Same thing with the right wing. Oh, it's personal values, personal values, personal values. Of course, they have no personal values either. <laughs> no more than the left wing does. Or noisy gongs, clanging cymbals, okay? If I hand my body over so that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. So in other words, some people will, will sacrifice themselves. It's kind of... Uh, they're like they're like martyrs. They pretend to be martyrs, but honestly, what they really want is the recognition, the acknowledgement. Look, and they and they will remind you of it constantly. Look what I did for you. If those words ever come out of your love mouth, look what I did for you. You didn't do what you did out of love. Okay, so let me. Let me show you again. When you say, look what I did for you. Therefore, you owe me. Right? That's the implication of that. Therefore, you owe me. 
then what you did was not done out of love. It means nothing, Paul says. <laughs> you can see why this is very much of a love passage, at least in terms of a sentimental experience for marriage. He goes on. Love is patient. Ah, he's going to tell us what love is now. So what is love? See, we seem to think that love is a squishy feeling in the pit of our stomach when we fall in love. Oh, it's nice. I always tell our couples that are about to be married, it's gas, it passes. Okay, that squishy feeling in the pit of your stomach, it comes and goes. Love isn't a feeling. In fact, if you listen to what Paul says, you will understand. You don't have to feel squishy towards somebody to love them. Love is patient. Let me do this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Okay? It's not envious or boastful or rude. So in other words, a person is crowing about what they did for you. They're not doing it out of love. So it's not envious, boastful, or rude. It's not arrogant. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures are all things. Love never ends. Oh, the squishy feeling in the pit of my stomach, it's gone. I don't love you anymore. How many marriages end as a result of that? One of the things I tell couples when you get up in the morning, the first day after you're married, you usually look over at the person and say, oh, I just love you so much. I just, oh, how amazing. And then there, the, there comes that day, five years, seven years down the road, you look over in the bed of the person that you've married and you say, good Lord, this is what you think. Good Lord, it's her again. And the first words out of your mouth should be, what? I love you. Because again, love isn't that squishy feeling in the pit of your stomach. This is what Paul is trying to say. These folks don't really care very much for each other. They're in conflict. They don't share an awful lot in common. But Paul is saying love overcomes these feelings that we have towards one another. This is what God did for while we were yet sinners. Our Lord Christ died for us. I'm sure he didn't feel a, a nice squishy feeling in the pit of his stomach when he hung there on a cross for all of humanity. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they come to an end. As for tongues, they cease. Knowledge, they come to an end. Okay, I want you to hear how profound this is. There are people, again, who are crowing about how their spiritual gifts are so impressive. I'm an amazing preacher. I'm an amazing prophet. I'm an amazing faith healer. And these are the people that get all the attention, get all the acclaim, and actually get all the moolah, too. They're the ones making money. But the kind people behind the scenes <clears throat> who are waiting on tables that, that see the person in need and go and help, they get nothing. Okay? And that's okay because they're not counting the cost. They're just doing it. They're not, they're patient, they're kind. They're not envious. They're not envious of these things and what other people are getting. They just, they, they know that their place is just to love others. Paul is saying that those are the people who get it. Because their gift is a gift of love. And that is ultimately the most important gift of all. So I think we need to really rethink our churches the people who are behind the scenes and sending cards to the shut-ins, making calls to people who are uh, just need to talk to somebody, people who clean the tables up after our church dinners and do the dishes and the sinks, those are the true heroes. 
is they're doing it out of love. They're not expecting acknowledgement or recognition. Paul goes on, we know only in part, we prophesy only in part, when the complete, complete comes, the partial comes to an end. So in other words, when we're finally in the presence of Christ, all these skills that we think are so important are going to be gone. The only thing that's going to remain is love, right? So, you know, these pastors who are making millions of dollars, honestly, and wearing their Armani suits and driving their $150,000 vehicles, they're going to get to heaven and all that's going to be stripped away and it's going to be gone. And they're going to say, what did you really represent? Did you represent love? Or were you doing this for yourself? When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put away child childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see him face to face. Now I know only a part, and I will be known fully, even as I have been known fully. And now these faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest is love. Notice he didn't say prophecy and preaching and teaching. Those things don't remain. Faith, hope, and love, the greatest is love. This is the only thing that we should be fixated and focused on in the church. So we come back to what is love. Love isn't a feeling. is isn't that squishy thing in the pit of your stomach. It's an action on behalf of others who may or may not deserve it. In the case of us, we don't deserve it from God, but he gives it to us freely. He's patient and kind with us when we fail. He's, he doesn't hold things against us or over our heads. He never says, well, pff, look what I did for you. This is not the way of love. Love hopes all things, bears all things, believes all things. We believe the best in each other. We work for each other's best interest, knowing that other people will work for my best interest. See, that's how it works in the kingdom of heaven. So I want to end with an illustration, and this actually famous painting, I, I don't, image, I guess, and I, I haven't looked it up to, to remember, recall where this is at, but again, the image of the, the, the two heavens, heaven and hell, the difference between heaven and hell. In hell, there is a banquet table with ample to eat, a feast for all, but you see, everyone has these huge utensils on the, the, the end extended from their arms. They cannot feed themselves, so everybody in hell goes hungry. In the kingdom of heaven, there is a same scenario. Huge banquet table filled with plenty, ample to eat. And once again, at the end of people's arms are, are spoons and, and forks, and they have no way to feed themselves. But no one goes hungry. Because why? In the kingdom of heaven, we feed each other. Now that's love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for Paul's message about love. The most important thing that we are to be known and identified with as a, as a church, as a people of God. Forgive us those times when our hate, our theological purity, our self-interest gets in the way of love. God, you loved us while we were sinners. Let us have the same love and caring for this world and for one another. If we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.